Welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest. This week, science writer Sarah Scholes on UFO culture. The UFO conspiracy is actually one of the ground level kind of gateway drug sorts of conspiracies. Especially right now, I think very socially acceptable to be like, yeah, I think aliens are here. You know, I saw that story in the New York Times about the Pentagon investigating UFOs. The meetings that I went to, it was a little bit like being at a church or a community center where if I'm there, I've had some kind of UFO experience. You know, maybe I talked to my neighbor about it and they're like, well, that, that guy's crazy. But if you go to a MUFON meeting, you can talk about what you've seen or what you believe. And, you know, other people are coming from a similar place. There's a, a researcher named Mick West, and he calls it the low information zone where it's not that this like has to remain unidentified forever because it's, it's truly unbelievable. It's just that we don't have the information that we need to identify it. Sarah Scholes, welcome to Chatter. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. You bet. Can you start off by telling us just a little bit about your, your background, especially the deep background, why you got into science writing in the first place, and especially the awesome mix of astronomy and, and culture and psychology and all of that stuff. Yeah, well, uh, it's a long story, but I can make it sort of short. It uh, starts around birth, probably. I, I grew up near... <laughs> <laughs> this is deep. Background. Yeah, this I is my it. full biography. Here we go. Uh, I grew up uh, very close to uh, Kennedy Space Center in Florida during the era of the shuttle. So like the idea of space and going to space was kind of always in my head, like I could watch the shuttle launches from my backyard. Um, and they would they would set off our burglar alarms in the house, actually, the sonic booms from them. And so, um, yeah, pretty early on, I decided, you know, I'm not going to be a test pilot. So if I want to be an astronaut, maybe I need to go study astronomy. So that was kind of the path that I, I set myself on pretty early, uh, not really knowing exactly what astronomy was. Um, and then um, I would say when I was around 12 or 13, I saw the movie Contact. Uh, and yeah. yeah, which is about a scientist who searches for extraterrestrial civilizations and then finds them. How many science careers do you think have been started <laughs> by people either watching that movie or even better reading the book, I think, but uh, it's just remarkable how many people come back to that one. Definitely, definitely. And still, I mean, it's it's a pretty old old movie now, not to date myself, but, uh, you know, people still watch it. I think it holds up yeah. pretty well. And uh, yeah, so I was fascinated with this idea that there's these invisible radio waves, which is what they were looking for, that you could um, kind of peer out into the universe and see. And so, um, yeah, I went to go study astronomy, but uh, it turns out that if you want to study a science, you have to be kind of very narrow in what you're interested in. And so... Um, yeah. Yeah, I uh, I turned to science writing where you can kind of, you know, you could write about black holes one day and copper mining the next day or wh whatever you want, really. And so and so that's how I got here. And importantly, you don't have to do hours and hours of math on a chalkboard. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's correct. I, I think I've mentioned this before in other conversations we've had here, but I was fascinated by astronomy as a kid, and I did not have the shuttle launches out my backyard. So for me, it was a more distant thing. But I was, I was pretty much on the course to do something having to do with astronomy. Mm -hmm. And then I got to college and took my first astronomy course. And the university I went to did have a small observatory, and I thought this is great. You know, I get to go look at planets. That's astronomy. And of course, the class is a math class. All you're doing is calculating all these things about distance and light. And and I think we got to the observatory something like twice during, it wasn't a lot. And I thought, this isn't what I had in mind. <laughs> yeah. I want to I I look at celestial bodies. I want to think about them. I want to speculate. I, I, I don't want to do calculations 90% of the time. Um, so that turned me away from astronomy as a career, but... I'm glad you went into it on the writing side. Yeah, yeah. What educational background was, was most useful to you? Was it like English and writing classes or did you find that taking a wide variety of science classes makes you kind of aware of what's interesting now to write about? Yeah, I think I personally benefited from going after the subject matter and kind of winging it on the writing. Um, yeah, I studied astronomy and physics in school and just kind of took one or two writing classes 
here and there. And I think if you're like, a, you know, a sort of competent writer, um, but you have very interesting things to say, then, then it's easier to hone the writing than to come up with the interesting things. And so, um, yeah, and, and kind of like you, uh, you know, the, the tedium of the, the calculations and things didn't appeal to me, but the big picture did. And so I think in writing, you're kind of allowed to look at that big picture and contemplate the universe and not, you know, where in the sky is Jupiter at this particular moment in time or something, something like that. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you the, the working on the writing thing certainly worked because you have three amazing books so far. You have Making Contact, the story of Jill Tarter, the inspiration for the lead character in Contact, which we've already mentioned. You have the, the new book, Countdown, all about nuclear weapons now. And you have, they are already here about UFO culture, which is what I think we'll probably talk about most here today, because it's a topic that I keep coming back to. The association of science and UFOs and aliens is just fascinating to me because scientists are and, and do look at these things for very particular purposes. But it's not what most physicists do. It's not what most astronomers do. Um, it's it's a very the search for extraterrestrial life is a very small slice of even that. And yet, there's this huge community of people who are interested in in aliens. And and I will conflate UFOs and aliens here because they often do. But we should note UFOs are just unidentified objects. Um, you know, we can call them anomalies, whatever we want. Um, but but th there seems to be all these people out there who are assuming that many or all scientists are either involved in a cover-up having to do with aliens <laughs> or are out there looking for them if they do anything having to do with space. And I'm guessing that's just not true. <laughs> no, uh, uh, m most astronomers are studying things like, you know, what can we learn about the the magnetic field of the star or how does a black hole collapse or what, what you know what happened right after the big bang and things that really only very obliquely have something to do with aliens but i think the the public fascination with them yeah far outweighs the amount of time that astronomers spend on it i think because you know in science you're always you're trying to find an answer, like a concrete answer. And is there life in the universe is like, you know, you could search for thousands of years and never know for sure, because you could always find it the next day. And so like in, in the, the way that modern science works, like it's hard to have a fruitful career looking for aliens, because unless you find them, it's always like, yeah. well, no, or maybe I don't know. It's like having a career playing the lottery. Uh, it's not very successful, but you know, one in a million, you know, you're going to do really well. Exactly, exactly. But I would say what's changed for astronomers is that you know, there's not a lot of them that do the search for smart extraterrestrials or civilizations. But now, um, you know, we do have technology to look for what are called biosignatures on other planets. So, like chemical indications that there might be life there, or um, microorganisms of some sort, which is obviously less exciting than, than little green men. But that has kind of, that, that is actually one of NASA's uh, focus areas right now. That is really interesting from a, a, you know, a kid who grew up, you know, in the era of science fiction, when I, I just love the books, particularly the books, but also some movies and, and other stories about contact with extraterrestrials. And it was never, in my memory, there was never one where the the initial contact, the initial find was a scientist detecting an organic molecule from a distance across hundreds of light years and determining that there could be a foundation for life. And it was never that, you know, I'm thinking of Rendezvous with Rama by Arthur C. Clarke, where there's a huge, obvious alien artifact um, that comes into our solar system, and it's undeniable that this has been created by some intelligent life. Or, of course, contact, where there's a message sent to Earth, and it can only be deciphered by humans because we've reached a certain technical capability to do it. Uh, even 2001, where there's a monolith buried on the moon, and you have to get to the moon, so you have to be able to travel in space to get that far, and the aliens know that. Um, but I don't recall one where it started with what I would consider like hardcore scientific, you know, use of techniques, like you mentioned, looking for, you know, organics or looking for some kind of microorganism signals from a distance. 
Yeah, I can't think of any either, actually. And I think, you know, it's it's probably way less exciting to find a molecule um, than, than a monolith. Um, and I think it's also, I think you use the word undeniable for those kinds of things that are in that science fiction, whereas... Um, you know, molecules or chemical signatures in an atmosphere or, um, you know, some some ambiguous fossil on Mars that looks like it could have been something very small and alive. Like those are it's hard to make those certain like it's it, they might never be undeniable. And so, you know, scientists could discover something light years and light years away and we would like forever be stuck in the well, maybe maybe not. And that, yeah, that doesn't really make for good science fiction. I'm sorry for what I'm about to do, Sarah, but I'm going to put you on the spot because oh no, yeah, the, the mention of Mars, I, I distinctly recall in the 1990s that there was a find uh, on Mars and President Clinton gave a press conference about you know, the, the finding of evidence of other life. I believe that clip was used in the movie version of Contact. Um, but because I focused on national security for 30 years, that's crowded out of my memory, the details <laughs> of what was actually found on Mars at that time, why was it at least briefly considered to be very strong evidence of life? And how has that how has that interpretation and analysis changed over the past decades? That is on the spot, but I think I got it. Um, yes. So <laughs> I know I had you here for for the right. <laughs> uh, yeah. So this was actually this is a, a finding called the Allen Hills meteorite, which was a piece of Mars that uh, you know. F- got flung off of the surface of the planet and came and landed on the surface of our planet. And uh, some scientists had had found it years earlier and then were investigating it in the 90s and found these, I believe they were like sort of, they thought they might be microscopic fossils, like uh, shape-based indications that there might be some some, uh, evidence of ancient life on this meteorite. And the scientists kind of published this paper that I think its conclusions were a little more tentative than the press release, which is always the case. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, they thought that, you know, this is this is the first evidence of tiny, tiny, not smart life on Mars. And then, of course, whenever there's a big scientific result that seems, you know, uh, out of this world, for for lack of a better phrase, people go and re-examine it. And in the end, uh, the preponderance of scientists thought that you know the, what what they saw in this meteorite could have been caused by geology and chemistry rather than biology but um this is again one of those inconclusive things like i believe some of the original authors of that paper still kind of hold on to the idea that it might be an indication of life but most other scientists have have moved on and said no we don't we don't really think so explain to me like i'm a fifth grader <laughs> How it is that a meteorite on Earth can be known with such certainty to be something that was ripped off of Mars and happened to land here? That's a good question. This will be a uh, a slight guess. <laughs> um, I don't know for sure for this particular meteorite, but there are chemical ways that you can know, like the ratios of different elements and compounds um, and isotopes or atoms of the atoms of the same type but with different numbers of neutrons are different um on different uh planets that and makes so, sense because yeah. each planet is a unique mix right. of yeah. minerals and elements and, and and okay so so you could know that this came from mars and then if something was within it you would have some some belief that that came from there and wasn't uh something that got onto it later. Right, right. Yeah. Well, this is this is the fun part, right? Taking this science, if you had a scientist actually trying to explain that, they would not be able to, right? Because they'd be so lost in the, <laughs> right. the minutia and jargon and details. But right. that actually makes some sense. So as you're you know, researching and, and writing about these topics, um, I think there's a vast public interest in a lot of issues having to do with astronomy, and of course, the search for extraterrestrial life. Um, But there's also some people out there who assume or project an agenda on everything being written about this topic, the idea that there's a massive conspiracy, either covering up what has been found before or something that is going on now. And I know you wrote extensively about this in your, your second book, They Are Already Here. But I'd like to talk about a little bit of the the foundations of that, because we don't have, contrary to ancient aliens on the History Channel, we, we don't have lots of history 
going back centuries, millennia of recordings of people talking about interactions with aliens or even things that they see other than the occasional supernova or meteor or comet. Uh, they note those things. Uh, people were much more tuned into the sky than than we are in today's age. But there, at least I don't recall reading in my histories of Rome and China and the Mongols and everything else, <clears throat> reports of alien visitations. It just doesn't show up in any of the written record. It seems to be a very modern phenomenon where people are thinking about that. And it seems highly correlated with when we found out that we weren't alone in the solar system, and then we learned about the universe being a big, wide place, um, and we started going into space. And I have to think that's more of a human phenomenon than a universal phenomenon that um, happens. So conceptualizing this, how do you think about the belief in not just alien life somewhere in the universe, but the belief in contact with human beings that has somehow been hidden or covered up? How do you think that started to evolve? And is it all about Roswell? <laughs> that's a big question. I mean, I think at, at a basic level, humans have always been interested in in this question of like, what, what more is beyond my everyday experience? Um, and what, you know, what is going on out there in the universe, even before they knew there was a universe? Like, what, what are these gods that control, you know, the volcanoes and the oceans and um, just try, trying to make sense of our, our place in the universe. And then I think you're right that, that when we began to conceive of, oh, you know, Earth is not the center of the universe, it's not even the center of the solar system. And then to learn also that there, you know, might be other planets out there, other solar systems just like ours, that the evolution of that question, like, what else is going on out there, I think tends to um, maybe naturally focus on, you know, if we're on a planet, there's this whole wide place out there, maybe there's other other us's. Um, <clears throat> and then we we are uh, ourselves with our own blinders and biases on. And so I think, you know, it's, it's also the correlation between, um, you know, to take UFOs, the kinds of UFOs we see and how we interpret them are very dependent on what our current level of technology is. So, you know, how people interpret UFOs is always kind of like a next step beyond what we've already developed or something sort of recognizable. To us when, you know, to me in reality, if if aliens were visiting in spaceships, there's no reason that they would be in, similar to our, you know, aviation industry uh, at all. And I think, you know, that does have a lot to do with, with Roswell, uh, which is the where a lot of people date like the first modern UFO sighting uh, in 1947 when uh, an object crashed on a, a, a ranch, the, the Brazel Ranch in uh, – um, <clears throat> near Roswell, New Mexico. Um, and you know, the, the official interpretation is that, that this was a military project to look for Soviet nuclear detonations. It was a, an acoustic sensor that flew in the atmosphere, crashed down on this guy's ranch. But of course, you know, in popular culture, it's, it's a UFO. Um, and it, you know, because it actually was this this government project, like the technology does resemble our technology because it's our technology. And then I think, you know, once once you have this one thing that then the government went on to actually put out a press release and say, like, this is one of those flying saucers you've been hearing about. It kind of just, you know, that that image implants in your mind and kind of, I think, sets the theme of UFO sightings for, for the rest of the 20th century. So it, I think as more and more government documentation is being declassified and released. And it's been going on for decades now. But there are lots of records of, I don't think people now realize just how massive the balloon infrastructure in the United States defense community was <clears throat> in the late 1940s and 1950s, before we started getting much better aerial reconnaissance and eventually satellite reconnaissance. Um, a lot of early detection, there were there were lots of balloons, and there are many other cases outside of Roswell, I understand, of debris landing and people saying, oh, that's some kind of a balloon with equipment. And it didn't take on the mythology that Roswell did. And I still have a hard time coming to grips with that because I don't know if there's a handful or dozens or hundreds of those other cases, but I've, I've read about several of them and people just shrugged it off and said, oh, you know, says USA somewhere on it, or it's clear that it's a balloon with a, with a sensor on it. And yet 
Roswell took off, and I'm still not sure why. Yeah, yeah, you're right. The, they, they actually had a term for the people who used to go retrieve the balloons for this particular nuclear project, which was called Project Mogul. They called them the balloonatics because they were running all over the country trying to <laughs> go catch go catch their crashed balloons. And you're right, there were, there were lots of them and for, for other projects um, that I'm less familiar with, too. But I think, you know, the... The Roswell story to me is a confluence of a few things. Um, the the very first uh, modern sighting of Uf UFOs, uh, as opposed to like a crash of UFOs, was just a couple weeks before um, the Roswell incident when a uh, a pilot was flying um, in Washington State. He was looking for another aircraft that had crashed, and he saw these uh, these things that looked like sort of uh, uh, Discs, as they were later described, flying faster than anything that he knew, um, you know, that the United States or anyone else had. Uh, and he came home and reported that um, to others. And then it made it into a newspaper with a slight mistrans mistranslation um, that they were saucer-like objects when he had said they, like, kind of skipped skipped in the sky like, like uh, saucers. So... Um, so then when this rancher in Roswell found this debris, you know, he for some reason didn't think, hey, this is an American balloon. He thought, hey, I read that thing about that guy, Kenneth Arnold in Washington. Maybe what I have found is one of those things that he saw. And eventually the debris made its way to the Army Air Force. And they said, you know, they wanted to cover up their projects. So they said, hey, yeah, it's one of those things. Crazy, isn't it? And then corrected it later. But actually, you know, it didn't really become a modern popular tale at the time. Uh, it kind of disappeared after the uh, Army Air Force retracted their press release um, and only got revived around the, the 1980s when some, some uh, sort of sensational authors kind of read about this story, revived it, and put this alien hypothesis on top of it. So it's actually not, not really very old as an alien myth. You know, it, it makes me think with the whole flying saucer I don't know, interpretation of the, the skipping line that in all of this, that there will be people who know what they're doing, that they're taking that and they're hyping it, whether they're, they're grifters or they're attention seekers. Um, th there definitely are some of those, but there are some people who literally don't know that that is that they heard about flying saucers. They don't go back to the original source and that that locks in, that becomes the truth to them. And that, that makes it very hard to talk about the UFO community as a monolith, because you have some people coming at it who are, you know, clearly in it for some kind of gain and others who are truly curious and just working off of the information they have, some of which is perhaps misinterpreted or just made up by, by others who have been on the other side of it. Definitely. And I think particularly for that second group, everything can become very personal and emotional too, especially if someone has seen something um, that was a UFO to them. And so you have, um, you know, you're working with the information that you have, you have this very meaningful experience, or you're just like deep in the mystery, and it becomes very personally meaningful. And it's hard to let go of your, you know, the hypothesis that you came in with, which, you know, to be fair, is the most compelling one, like an alien built a spaceship, and it's, it's here, and it's a flying saucer, um, is much more compelling than um, a stratospheric balloon. Uh, although those are pretty cool, also. But um, yeah, and it's they really are. Yeah. And um, there's another group of people who are aware of the history, do maybe think a little more critically about the interpretations of, of UFOs and are trying to do like kind of an agnostic analysis of things. But I think that's a much smaller group than probably the other two. And you actually attended, if I remember correctly, you actually attended the International UFO Congress. Is that what it's called? It is called that. Yeah. Yeah, and you so you got to interact with uh, one of, if not the, you know, biggest gathering in this wider community. And how did you find that mix? Did you find that there were people there who were kind of winking and nodding, or was everybody in that true believer set? I would say, you know, I think some of the higher profile speakers, I would say, perhaps knew that they were you know, 
telling tales are grifters are trying to get a get a following maybe they have some ufo belief but you know i saw presentations on things that have been long debunked um as yeah false documents and that's the frustration right is if there's something new and something interesting yes please let's talk about it um but when it's something that is you know (laughs) has the facts have clearly come out and people are still pushing it it makes you wonder uh that they should know it and they're irresponsible if they don't bother to find out. Right, right. And then and then I think it becomes pretty unfair to the audience who in my experience of them were, you know, they largely came there because they were true believers. And so when someone got up on stage and said, you know, I have these documents from this group of people called the the Majestic 12 who were briefing the president on the presence of aliens uh on on earth today you know, people who are coming from a mindset of like, I already believe this are just like, wow, that's amazing. Instead of, you know, where did those documents come from? Are those real? Have they already been debunked? And so, you know, I think that's taking advantage of of people who have a sort of natural belief in something. And then part of this comes from people who either are or become celebrities, right? You have people within the UFO community that draw the big crowds and, and they get a lot of attention um, and then you have some people who, you know, are famous in other ways, but have become fascinated with this topic. And I'm thinking here of um, Tom DeLonge of Blink-182 fame, um, who's a very prominent person, has helped sponsor organizations that have to do with this. And just like any other field in in human endeavors, is it true that some people are drawn to it just because of the the, the social aspect, the the being around interesting people. And it's not necessarily about the search itself, but more about finding a community and something to belong to. Yeah, I think I think that there is a lot of that that goes on. I mean, we have the the aspect that you're mentioning of you know there's a a leader, or someone you recognize, and someone I don't I don't know if anybody ever like trusted Blink 182, but you have some like cultural trust or recognition with being like, well, you know, why would that guy? You know, he sang my favorite song when I was a teenager. He has access to people I don't. Maybe he knows things that I don't. And so you give him that kind of authority and then kind of does, he kind of does get a following or other people with similar status do get a following. And um, then the people in the following, you know, they have common experiences, they have common beliefs, they like to gather at things like the International UFO Congress. Um, or actually, I found this a lot at the, I went to some mutual UFO network. Uh, meetings, which is kind of a, just a sort of grassroots. Is this the MUFON? MUFON. Yeah. Yeah. I'm fascinated by, and this was one I was not as familiar with, but it's a, it's a community, but it's had a lot of infighting, right? Yes, it has. Yeah. It's a, yes, they've had some scandals at the top of their, their organization um, with uh, illegal internet activities and, you know, racist comments by leaders and, and things like that, which is a, not great. And if you're, you know, trying to answer big questions like, are there aliens on earth? Not a great direction to go, but kind of at the, at the lower levels, at the community levels, you know, the meetings that I went to, it was a little bit like being at a church or a community center where just, you know, if, if I'm there, I've had some kind of UFO experience, you know, maybe I talked to my neighbor about it and they're like, well, that, that guy's crazy. Um, But if you go to a MUFON meeting, you can talk about what you've seen or what you believe and uh, you know, other people are coming from a similar place. And so there's a lot of kinship, I think. And so that, that becomes an important place for, for people who are coming from that mindset. What, what were the big, other than obviously, you know, racist comments and potential crime, put that aside. uh, What were the biggest fault lines within MUFON and the UFO community in general over the years that, because obviously there are people coming, bringing different experiences, having different interpretations, having different goals for what they wanted to do. Um, what are those fault lines? And as you were investigating this, what did you find were the most interesting conflicts within the UFO community? Yeah, within MUFON, um, the most interesting thing to me involved their investigations of, of UFOs. So like if if you went out tonight saw something strange in the sky and you Googled, like, who can I report this to? Um, MUFON is probably one of the first places that will come up and they have this pretty extensive form you fill out about what you saw, 
um, and then they'll assign in a, a trained investigator to go try to figure out what it what it is um, and if it's if it's a true UFO. And so they have a database of all of these people's sightings and whether they were solved or not. And to me, the biggest fault line in the organization was how how rigorous the training was for figuring that out and how um, biased people were going into the investigations. Like, are they, you know, applying a true scientific method to trying to figure out what this was, or are they coming in with, you know, this is something strange. And, um, and it, you know, with an, with an organization that's just all volunteers who are clearly, you know, part of a UFO organization, you're going to have some unevenness in, in how people are, are doing that. And um, I think that was one of the big things there. You mentioned the phrase trained investigator, and I'm wondering what that, what that means within that community, because there, there, there are, you know, programs and institutions and certifications for investigators in, in other areas. Um, is that what applies here or does a trained investigator mean something different? Well, it's uh, it's slightly incestuous, I guess, because MUFON sets its own standards and does its own training. So it has a book for, um, you know, uh, and a course you can go through to to say like, you know, it aims to be like, how do you think critically about this? How do you search, you know, flight databases? How do you learn about whether there were military test flights going on? How do you evaluate a hypothesis? But it does come from this organization rather than, you know, maybe some outside certifying body. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I found compelling in, in, in your book, they are already here, the, the time you actually spent talking to these investigators and how they, you know, some of them don't like each other. And it's not necessarily personality based. It's well, they're undermining the movement because they're so, you know, they're open to any idea and they don't apply any critical thinking. And they're, they're not using these tools of investigation, whereas I, and it's, it makes sense. That's probably true in, in many fields. But in this field where reports are so often taken without, without that critical lens, it's important to have people who think about how can we investigate this and check out all those flight patterns and other things while we're doing it. Yeah. It's also, it, I mean, even with the best of intentions and the best of uh, critical thinking training, I think it's really hard to pin down what anyone's UFO sighting is because it's just a it's a personal report. It's with your own senses. Your brain plays tricks on you. Your eyes play tricks on you. I used to never understand how people thought that Venus was a UFO, which is something that does happen until I saw Venus on the horizon, you know, flickering in lots of different colors, looking like it was moving toward me. But, you know, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, so I think, you know, y you can misperceive what's happening because Venus was not, in fact, you know, shooting towards me. It was just my eyes playing tricks. But Right. I've had similar experiences uh, when I was a kid and could see the nighttime sky better than I can now. Uh, I remember once looking up and seeing a UFO. And that's what it was at the time. It was an unidentified aerial phenomenon. And it was a, a bright object moving slowly across the sky. It wasn't an airplane, had no flashing lights, no red, no green, but it was something that was moving. I shouldn't say slowly because it looked like it was booking along, um, but it was moving steadily across the background sky in a way that I had no context for. I, so for me, it was like, oh my, I, have I just seen an alien spacecraft? And my father said, no, you've just saw a satellite, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. yes. And now with Starlink, um, I think that's more common where people will see a train of lights and it's, that's the kind of thing that a couple of decades ago would have led to Roswell level panic. Um, and now it's like, oh wait, I just checked, you know, Starlink was going over the area and you have that trail of, of lights um, and then once I did see something moving towards me in a way that I could not explain, um, and it had to do, it was cloudy. It had to do with some, some fog, um, some atmospheric issues. I later understood, um, it was simply a plane, but because the plane had lights, it was close enough that it had the front lights coming at you like headlights. Um, and be because of the way that the clouds were, it looked like something was moving in a way that was unnatural. But as it got closer and popped through the cloud layer, I said, oh, yeah, that's a plane. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think a lot of people see things they, they don't understand. If they take the time to investigate it, think about it, most of them kind of do make sense, right? Mm -hmm. 
But that doesn't mean there aren't things out there that are still weird. And the one people focus on now, some of the footage that's been released, you know, the little pill and other things that have come out, there are still things that the best investigations can't figure out. And the step some people go to is we can't understand what that is yet, therefore aliens, or it's we don't understand what those things are yet, therefore let's keep asking questions, let's keep searching, let's get better at bringing in perceptual psychology as well as um, the, the science of velocity and movement and all these things. How have you found that to be in your research when there's the truly unknown cases, the ones that don't have an explanation and even the U.S. government has come out with the anomalies office saying, yeah, we're still checking things out, is you would think that that would lead people to say, okay, there's a serious good faith effort going on here to figure out what these things are, perhaps a national security risk from technology we don't understand from adversaries. Um, or is it, well, the government's releasing this because they're covering up the really big stuff. Right. <laughs> Right, that's uh, that's the fun dichotomy. Yeah, I think I mean at least the uh, the first report to come out of the Department of Defense. I think you know when they looked at the the cases that they had, you know, the vast vast majority of them remained unidentified. I believe, right. um, um, and that is not. I mean, some of them they said you know they have these unbelievable seeming characteristics, but most of them were fairly banal seeming, but. You know, uh, they they fall into what uh, there's a, a researcher named Mick West, and he calls mm -hmm. it the low information zone, where it's not that this like has to remain unidentified forever because it's it's truly unbelievable. It's just that we don't have the information that we need to identify it, and um, that most most of those unidentified things probably fall into that category. But yeah, you're right. You know, I I in my own mind fall definitely into the first camp that you describe of you know, great. You know, the, uh, if there are things in the sky that, that we can't identify that are near, uh, you know, military aircraft and, and ships and things. Yeah. That's the department of defense's job to figure out what that is and, and, uh, figure out if it's a threat, if it's, a, um, you know, our own project, someone else's project, um, and to, to take care of, of, you know, national security in, in that way. But I think with people who are coming from the perspective of like, this is definitely aliens, like no report is going to be satisfying. No investigation is going to be satisfying because if they, if they don't find aliens, it could always be, yeah, that they're covering it up or not telling us the the whole truth or things like that. So you kind of, you can't win there really. I had a, a case of this hit me uh, directly and personally in November at the uh, Hayden Center uh, at George Mason University, I hosted the, the the first public open conversation with Sean Kirkpatrick of the awfully named All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. It's a mouthful. Yeah, it's, it's bad. Yeah. Uh, but but he he talked about the you know how we explore what we do, how we how we process information, how we use analysis to try to resolve these things, and. There was someone that I know who came to me afterwards and said, you know, hey, really, really good conversation. You know, that was good to, to hear him talk about all that. I said, oh, thank you. Yeah, that's nice. And then he said, um, it's a shame they're keeping him in the dark on so many things. And I said, wait, what? He said, yeah, you know, I, I feel sorry for him. You know, he's doing the best he can. Um, but, you know, I, I just don't think he's in on the real stuff. I said, I'm like, well. How can you, 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 that's not a conversation starter. There, there's no way to have a productive conversation if, you know, when somebody comes out and explains procedures on something that's had a lot of mythology around it, the immediate answer is, well, you're only talking because you don't actually know the truth and you're part of the cover up wittingly or not. Um, I found that to be a bit depressing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's hard when people bring unfalsifiable assumptions in into things like that and um yeah i think i think also you know the big thing to me about you know i think i think most people including probably sean kirkpatrick and the you know nasa's ufo investigation team and many reputable scientists would be thrilled if uh aliens were driving spaceships absolutely uh, around earth yeah. but but like you said the the leap from i see something i can't identify 
Therefore, a civilization rose on a planet far away that built spacecraft that could fly long distances and drove them particularly here at the particular moment that I happen to be on Earth is like a very that I feel like you have to have more evidence for that for that interpretation. Yeah. But um, I think it's so culturally entrenched that, you know, even though it's a, a very large leap, it's the one people to make. Yeah, that just clashes with evolution. I mean, our brains have developed in such a way to to look for agency, to look for, you know, a power behind something when there is ambiguity. And that makes a lot of sense for survival reasons. But it also means if you see something strange, you know, the example that's always used is there's a shadow on the grassland. Um, and if you're somebody who is prone to think that might be a tiger, um, you'll have a lot of false alarms. You'll be running from shadows a lot. But chances are you will survive to the next generation and pass that gene on. Whereas if you see a tiger and you think, ah, I don't recognize that as anything that has agency, that could just be a shadow, you might not make it. So it makes sense that you see something unknown and somewhere in the brain, it says there must be something behind that. There must be something driving this. And since it can't be an airplane and since it can't be a balloon and it can't, well, People driving this thing have to be aliens. Like I kind of see how that thinking developed. Yeah, that actually, that's a very good point. That that, that does make total sense. Uh, you know, on the other hand, I think part of being a modern human is trying to overcome some of our evolutionary impulses that no longer serve us and or maybe no longer help us interpret the world uh, correctly. Like, like there's all kinds of logical fallacies that our brains are prone to that that we've uh, tried to leap leap over as as we. Um, progress. And I think, um, yeah, maybe that should be one of them more than it is. Absolutely. I mean, it's so interesting, the, the social psychology that, that explains so much of this from the outside, you can look at it, but that doesn't help you. Like when, when you are at one of these conferences talking to somebody, you're not going to give them a lecture on, you know, in-group and out-group identity and the, you know, the structure of beliefs and, and how people can be misled you're talking to them as human beings and trying to figure out, you know, what they are looking for in this adventure. And so many people are looking for it. That is, you know, you've been to Roswell, you've been, you, you actually went to area 51 and drove all around it, right? <laughs> I sure did. Yeah. At this point in my life, I've been there, I think four or five times now. Talk about those experiences, like, you know, driving in and around area 51. How, how did it feel knowing people go there, you know, thinking, there are alien bodies there, not just, you know, experimental aircraft. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's one of those uh, unfalsifiable things like, you know, they're not letting me in there. As far as I know, they're not letting you in there. Even if we went in there, we would never know that we searched the whole thing for the alien bodies. So like no one can really ever prove that they're not there. But I love, uh, well, I love the perimeter of Area 51 since I've never been inside. But uh, the, fir the first time I went, it was actually a, a really amazing experience because as uh, I went with my sister and a friend and as we were driving into the, the valley just outside of the border to the base, we saw an orange light in the sky appear, grow brighter, kind of float, and then a series of other little orange orbs appear, do the same thing, hover, it, it's aliens. forming a saucer shape. Exactly. Yeah. And I was like, I can't believe I came here. As soon as I arrived, I'm seeing little orange hovering lights in the shape of a saucer hovering over over wow. the Nevada desert. This is, this is amazing. Um, and, you know, I didn't think it was aliens, but I was like... That's very cool. I don't know what it is. And I understand how if you came out here being like, you know, I believe in flying saucers, literally saw what looked like a flying saucer. Um, and, uh, you know, it turns out it was, you know, a, f a, a flare flares that a, a jet had dropped in a yep. pattern, um, you know, to, to distract a, a heat heat seeking missile or to, to practice that. Um and then later, later that same night, you know, uh, we were sitting around the campfire, looked up, this uh, array of little white dots appeared in the sky in like a perfect matrix um, <clears throat> and uh, just kind of moved in unison across like almost half of the sky. And that, you know, to me, actually, that still is a UFO. Like, I don't know what that is. Um, nobody's going to tell me. And uh, so I think, um, you know, e even though I didn't think it was aliens, I think it's it's actually it's a cool feeling to see something that you don't understand and to just kind of 
wonder and ponder like you know i think you know what's the air force working on um yeah but (laughs) i definitely see how you could see something like that that is that you've never seen and be like wow what technology Mm -hmm. did the air force steal from the aliens i get that too yeah one one thing that's I think relatively common, and I think you experienced this when when you were out there. Many of these sites that have either like an Area Fifty One or, or other military test ranges uh, bases where you know there, there are things going on, they, they tend not to be in major cities, right? They tend to be out there for very good reason for um, both secrecy for developing you know advanced programs, but also if you're testing you know, aircraft that are flying at Mach 1 or more, you need big distances. Uh, And so they tend to be places that are out there and relatively dark. And I've seen several reports in sources of people who go to these sites and are just watching, you know, looking for the sometimes alien technology that are, it's being kept and tested at these bases. Or I think just as often people who want to see some cool experimental aircraft, even if from miles and miles away. But they'll have reports of seeing one or often two bright lights that appear to be hovering in the sky, um, sometimes moving slightly, but then occasionally just going away and coming back. And many people only realize when, if they stick around and see it, that, you know, if you're in a semi-mountainous climate in the dark and there's a car on a road far away you're not going to see the car. You're not going to see the road. You might not even see the mountain. You see lights that appear to be in the sky that are actually you know, moving in a way that is completely foreign. Um, but so many of these are just random cars on highways far away. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. To me, that's, that's just so fun to find out the mystery of what are the optical effects of different things in different environments. That, to me, has just as much mystery and allure as assuming aliens. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Actually, where I live, I live in Colorado. Um, and there's some some mountains right behind me with, you know, uh, dirt, uh, little traffic to dirt roads, and then a lot of hiking trails. And, and at night, you can actually even see people's headlamps who are just walking on trails. So, you know, they'll blink, oh. blink in and blink out as they go up the switchbacks. You can sometimes see people's campfires. Um, another time, yeah, I've, I've been on a, a, a UFO watching trip where, you know, I saw somebody else's campfire and it was slightly elevated from me in the dark. And so it looked like it was up in the sky. It's flickering. It's doing weird things. I think, yeah, the way that we process lights and, and the way that they um, travel through particularly the desert air and things like that is, is super, super interesting. And I think, you know, the, what this says to me is anytime you start looking for UFOs, like you'll see them. Um, and sometimes you solve what they are. Um, and it's somebody's campfire. You know, the, the, the corollary to what you just said, if you, if you look for them, you'll see them. There is that belief among some people in the community that people who don't see UFOs are the ones who, who don't believe that the very act of wanting to see them brings the aliens to you. Um, Talk through that, because I think you experienced some of that when you were writing your book, that you heard that belief that if you think you're going to see something, um, then somehow through, I don't know, magic, um, then the interdimensional beings or or aliens will make themselves apparent to you. Yeah, I I feel like that belief exists in kind of two forms, Um, kind of the the lower level one maybe being like, if if you're open to it, then you will notice things that are strange. And if you're closed off to it, then, you know, you, you won't notice it or you won't interpret it as something interesting. But then, yeah, the, the higher level version is that in some way you can sort of manifest aliens to right. uh, to come to you. You can, uh, I don't know if anybody remembers that book, The Secret from a while ago, but if you will it hard enough, it will happen. And there's... um. Yeah, there there is actually one. Um, there is a UFO uh, famous person uh, who who kind of takes people out into the desert to specifically do this kind of like meditative thinking about like bring you know we want you to come here we want you to appear and and says you know if if you guys kind of meditate hard enough on this thought that that will attract them. And so that, you know, it's a, that, that involves believing that you can connect our psychology to the psychology of alien beings. But um, I think maybe, I guess, uh, since we 
I brought up manifestation and the secret, I guess probably kind of just fits with the way we generally think about things. Like if you want something hard enough, if you focus on it hard enough, like it can become yours, but applied to alien spaceships. And and at that extreme, it becomes coterminous with religion, right? The idea of praying for something makes it happen or, you know, being faithful enough and believing enough despite what, you know, that it, it takes on the characteristics of a religion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, UFO belief has uh, so some people, some religious scholars actually study it as a new religious movement. Um, yeah, because, you know, you know, if there are aliens, they are a sort of higher power, especially if they're kind of coming here, watching over us, um, or at least watching us. Um, and it's, you know, the search for something larger than yourself, like you were, you were talking about earlier, a little bit of, you know, the meaning of like, what are we doing here? What is the meaning of life in the universe? Is there other life in the universe? It has all these big picture sorts of questions that religion, religion does also within this, this higher power, um, that is, you know, at least recognizable to us in, in the way that, you know, historically gods have been also. You also mentioned uh, in your book the SETI or search for extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, the mindset of SETI salvationism. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's a, that's a, a related to this, but just a little bit different in terms of why some people are searching for alien life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the search for extraterrestrial intelligence usually involves uh, involves looking for like broadcasts or signals from technologically advanced alien civilizations out there, usually radio wave broadcasts like in, in the movie Contact. And a lot of um, <clears throat> people who do this work, when they kind of state why they're interested in it or what difference it will make to people talk about, you know, if there are aliens out there that their existence which is so different from our existence presumably would unite us on earth um and you know it would it would minimize our differences make us more peaceful and also the existence of the civilization that had clearly lasted a long time long enough to to be advanced could show us how not to you know nuclear bomb each other to death or or things like that would give us some an example to follow or faith that we could make it through. Um, and so just kind of bring world peace and long lasting civilization uh, to earth, which is, yeah, very religious in its own way. I'm a little skeptical. Uh, so I'm skeptical <laughs> on both sides of this question. So one side is the SETI salvationism of, you know what, the, the, the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence would be of this revelatory moment and humans would stand around and hold hands and sing Kumbaya and realize, you know what, this is a way out of all of our problems because they'll bring us advanced technology and solve things, you know? So now we're to childhood's end by Arthur C. Clarke or V the TV series uh, from the eighties. Um, the technology comes and suddenly it's a garden of Eden. And of course, most science fiction then comes to the next step, which is, Oh, Whenever there's something that good, there's always there's always another clause to the contract. Um, but I just I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's my skepticism about the the ability of humanity to come together in that sense. If we can't do it about climate change and we can't do it about uh, war, uh, the idea that there's a smart creature out there is suddenly going to make us forget about all these problems. Um, the other side of it, of course, is the extraterrestrial panic belief, um, which often is cited by people in the UFO community as to why there is a government cover-up, because the government assesses that if the public knew about extraterrestrials, they would panic and people would lose all control. And in order to keep control over the population, we can't tell them the truth. And I just don't get that either. Um, I can't believe that with all of the face-to-face -face tensions that people face, right, whether in our personal lives that we handle relatively civilized uh, fashion or whether it's warfare, whether it's famine and starvation, the idea that learning about extraterrestrial intelligence would suddenly make us panic and make everything worse than it already is, I, I don't see that. And I certainly don't see that as a government motivation. But wondering what you think about those, these beliefs that if tomorrow we were to find out that 
yes, there is either undeniable or really, really good evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence. Do you think that, you know, the average person out of seven, eight billion, that that most people are going to change their daily life as a result? No, <laughs> I'm with you. And I think my uh, my biggest piece of evidence uh, kind of refuting both ends of that spectrum is that actually, I think a majority of people or a close to a majority of people in the United States, at least, do believe that we do have evidence of aliens or like, you know, there's headlines once or twice a year that like, you know, we found some we found some signal, we found some uh, planet that seems to have life. And, you know, they're like, oh, that's interesting. And kind of file it away in their mind as like NASA found aliens, and then they just move on with their lives. Like if you ask people, you know, has did NASA find aliens on Mars? Like a not small fraction of people will say yes. And so there's actually just a bunch of people walking around who already think this, who aren't, you know, undermining uh, <laughs> civilization or bringing lo- bringing everyone together. And so yeah, I mean, I think. I think there's little evidence that it would cause panic and little evidence that people would maybe care that much. And uh, I think in terms of the the salvation end of things, like nothing in human history has ever done that for us. Um, We've never behaved that way in the past. And even if we found evidence of aliens, I think we'll still be humans and humans uh, fight with each other. There's a couple of uh, national security angles here that I want to get your your thoughts on. You know, one of them is the idea of the way we tr- typically think of security is you know defense from threats. And I don't know. I think since a kid, I've had the thought that a lot of science fiction movies of alien invasions of Earth are kind of silly because at the stage of technology we are at, you know, other than the War of the Worlds idea, right? Other than you know bacteria or viruses that, you know, an alien species has not been exposed to. If they have the technology to do something that we obviously can't, which is travel tens or hundreds of light years in a reasonable time frame and have the, the technology to do that safely, um, I don't think our weaponry is going to be that successful if they, if they want to decimate the planet. Um, so there's that side of it, which is pure national security the Independence Day type scenarios of aliens come here and we can fight them off using our existing technology, maybe with a little bit of assistance from alien technology. Um, I find that kind of silly, but I'm looking at it from from my perspective. What's yours? Yeah, I mean, I think that that is, is probably true. If you can send a spacecraft across across the galaxy to a particular planet, and fly it around this this planet that you've never been to before. You definitely have something better than a nuclear weapon um, that you could use, or something that could neutralize uh, our our weapons. And so, yeah, I I agree with you. The idea that um, we who uh, you know Jill Jill Tarter, the uh, kind of one of the founders of of SETI as a field, likes to point out how how young we are as a civilization technology is um yeah very young and so any anything out there is going to be far more advanced than us and we wouldn't really stand a chance i don't think the other national security angle is 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 more about us than about the threat from the outside and it's conspiracism right it's the idea of conspiracy culture and the rotting that happens to a community's ability to rally and do much of anything, much less, <clears throat> much less defend itself. Um, and that's something that I think we, we can learn something from the UFO community, which is very, by definition, conspiratorial in many ways when it gets to the you're hiding aliens. Um, you've written that, that UFOs, the way we see UFOs, it's really a mirror of ourselves um, that we put onto the UFOs what we believe. But if the belief is, you know, if there's anything having to do with aliens, it's because, you know, the government is lying to us and we are just pawns. That has side effects for thinking about other things having to do with government and community. So again, from your research, from from being with this community so long, talking with them in depth, how do you how do you grok that whole thing about conspiracy culture and how it infects 
what they think about other things. Yeah, I mean, I think the the UFO conspiracy is actually one of the ground level kind of gateway drug sorts of conspiracies because you know it's it's uh, especially right now I think very socially acceptable to be like yeah I think aliens are here you know I saw that story in the New York Times about the Pentagon investigating UFOs and so um, it's a it's a short step to the idea that you can't trust what the government tells you about it and they're hiding things from you and it's a short step from that to they're hiding lots of things from you and you can't trust them on anything and there's this plan um that the elites have for you beyond you um that you are not in control of and i think that that that, that um at least you know according to you know people like anthropologists who study uh how how conspiracy theory mindsets work is it's uh you know pattern recognition, finding meaning in disconnected events, and then also feeling like you you are a powerless individual and these forces are at work beyond your control that you you can't trust and affect your your life. And so I think to me, um, you know, I think we see a lot of that in in much more, you know, dangerous conspiracies, I would say, than than UFOs, but UFOs to me kind of function as a way to introduce people to that mindset if you're not careful. And I mean, to be, to be clear, I also don't think that we should try, you know, I don't trust the government on everything. They haven't always been truthful. Bad things happen. Unethical things happen. But I think you have to apply as critical a mindset to any uh, conspiracy that you are thinking about as, as to other stuff. That's the tough part, right? I mean, there are real conspiracies, right? There was, there was a 9-11 conspiracy. And it was not Dick Cheney setting charges inside the towers of the World Trade Center. It was, you know, the hijackers uh, conducting a conspiracy. There was a conspiracy against Julius Caesar. There was a conspiracy to take down the U.S. government in 1865 by assassinating Lincoln and Johnson and Secretary of State Seward. There are real conspiracies. Um, so we can't be blind to those. But assuming that everything is a conspiracy, that there's there's a power behind everything, and that helps us come to grips with our own lack of control. Um, that that's that's rotting. That that has a, a very negative influence. Um, but I think with the UFO thing, it, it kind of makes sense to me. Now I don't I don't remember that sense of heavy conspiracism when I was a, a boy reading my first space stories and UFO stories. I'm sure it was there. But we're going back now to the 1980s, and I don't remember it as much. But in the 90s and afterwards, I I wonder if there's a correlation here, because by the 90s, you had the X-Files, which was all about grand conspiracy stuff. You had the JFK movie, which did change American opinion on thinking the JFK assassination was a a bigger conspiracy, more so than uh, the public had believed before. You, you end up with the movie Conspiracy Theory, which was a big movie, although I think The X-Files had a wider impact. But there's a whole bunch of pop culture that's come out. Whereas in the 80s, it was me going through the grocery store with my mother and seeing the Weekly World News. And the front page had a picture of a really badly drawn alien baby hybrid with a human. That's kind of the conspiracy theory silliness I remember seeing in pop culture in the 80s. But in the 90s, it got real. It got serious uh, and it got much more mainstream. And I'm wondering if that's happened to conspiracy culture that, you know, that really has set that going and made us made us think that there probably is something behind everything. Yeah, I think I mean, to me, it has a lot to do with actually maybe paradoxically the fact that we we do know more about what goes on within the government like it's progressively you know since since the mid 20th century probably become more transparent we hear about more more is declassified and so then as you learn more you do learn about these real conspiracies or or times the government did lie and so i think um yeah Maybe, yeah, paradoxically, the, the more transparent things are, maybe the more likely some people are to believe in conspiracy theories or to believe that you can't, can't trust anything. And then that makes its way into things like, things like the X-Files. And, um, I mean, the, the hard part is like, 
it's fun. Like I like the X-Files <laughs> myself. I used to, you know, I'm a reporter. I used to do a thing that I kind of jokingly called conspiracy theory Fridays, where on Fridays I would go down internet rabbit holes uh, doing research on my wildest ideas to see if I could find any evidence that they are true. Um, and, uh, so I, I get the impulse. I have it, I have it myself and, uh, yeah, I'm a child of the late eighties and nineties. So maybe that, that makes sense too. Well, I'm curious about one other thing in your background um, as we're wrapping up here. If I recall correctly, you worked as a public education officer at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, Green Bank, uh, West Virginia. And and I'm wondering, that's not as, as well known or as prominent as some other astronomy space related sites. You, you already mentioned, of course, Kennedy Space Center being being one. But even there, as the public education officer, were you getting some of this community coming out and asking questions and you know thinking things about this observatory being somehow connected to alien life? Yeah, for sure, absolutely. And it it um you know I I mostly helped run kids science camps and let them use the old uh, telescopes that were there. That's it was the awesome. Part. Yeah, but then you know sometimes I would give tours of the site and almost inevitably on a tour someone would ask, you know, so like, have you, have you guys seen any evidence of aliens? Would you tell us if you did just, and, uh, <laughs> anticipating that question, we actually had a little tiny green rubber alien at the front of the, the tour bus, just cause you you're like, that's, that's what people are interested in. And kind of, like you said earlier, that's what they think all astronomers are doing all the time. And, uh, actually there, you know, it was, it was true to some extent, there is some, uh, SETI work that goes on there. And it was actually the, the site of the very first SETI investigation that uh, an astronomer named Frank Drake did. He looked at two stars that were like the sun with a radio telescope to see if he could see any or detect any radio waves that looked like aliens made them. And so, you know, people's interest in that isn't isn't coming out of nowhere. But um, I had to I had to tell them, you know, if if I heard that we had found uh, a signal from aliens, no one could keep my mouth shut. Like I would tell you personally. So uh, it'll get out. Astronomers aren't good at keeping secrets. I think there are two two sides there that overlap our backgrounds and experiences. Uh, the the first is same thing happened to me from working at CIA. Oh, yeah. Is one of the most common questions you'd get from somebody who has not worked in or around the government is, do they really keep aliens in the basement? I said. No, the aliens worked in the cube right next to me. You know, they were our, they were our friends. Um, but then often when I, I wrote about the the president's daily brief, the daily intelligence document that goes to the president every day and has for decades and which took on a little bit of a conspiratorial angle when they simply named the second national treasure movie, um, the, the Book of Secrets. But a question I would get routinely when speaking about the the intelligence going to the president is, you know, d- does the PDB tell the president about alien visitations? Um, it just comes up all the time. Um, but the other side of it is, of course, that if if I did have any information about that, um, that means I wouldn't be the only one, right? There's a whole community that would be involved in this. And the amount of people it would take to keep a grand conspiracy quiet for decades, whether it's a fake moon landing idea or a 9-11 being an inside job idea, or there's a massive government cover-up of alien technology, um, we see how you know three people in a White House meeting, one of them will go to the press within a month about it if it's controversial, and you're going to keep hundreds or thousands of people quiet? I just find that hard to believe from my experience, whether it's scientists or intelligence officers or the press. People, people love talking about interesting stuff. And it'd be hard for people to keep quiet about something as interesting as this. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I haven't uh, worked in in government in the way you have, but uh, in my experience, pretty much everything leaks in in one way or another. Um, And uh, yeah, especially, you know, if if you believe like the classic UFO conspiracy um, and we've been hiding it for decades since the 1940s, that's thousands and thousands of people and, you know, many decades, which just seems unrealistic. Well, this is the point in the conversation where we reach into our chatterbox and find a question for you. Sarah. Oh, this is great. 
Should the U.S. send a manned mission to Mars? Oh, um, that is a great question. And I uh, I go back and forth on it, honestly. I, I used to be very you know, pro space exploration at all, at all costs, just like, you know, we're humans, we explore, Mm -hmm. but there is a part of me now that is like, you know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of resources. It's, um, you know, a lot of people think of it as like, well, if we're going to destroy our planet, we need to spread ourselves among multiple planets, but our planet will probably never be as destroyed as Mars already is. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a harder place to live. Um, but I think, you know, I, I still do have that spark of wonder within me. Uh, and I think, I think that we should give it a shot um, and do it. I don't know that uh, we need to continue to occupy Mars and say the way that we've continued to occupy the International Space Station. Um, but I think, you know, seeing if we can do it, um, advancing that technology, seeing where that technology takes us in other realms is is useful, but there's probably diminishing returns to remaining on the surface of Mars for a very long time. I think you've laid out both sides really well. Um, <laughs> Sarah Scholes, thank you for joining me for the conversation. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. That was Chatter a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter.